Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and today we have a really special Kickstarter preview of a game called Trip Lock. This game is by Chip Theory Games, so this is Josh and Adam Carlson. Uh, again, if you've been watching my Too Many Bones playthrough, this is the next game, not in that series, but the next game coming from that same company. And it is at a much lower price point, so it has a, a much uh, easier barrier of entry. It also plays solo and also two player. So as you can see on the mat, you've got one side here, uh, like giving you your skill actions, or your skills on one side, I should say, and then the exact same thing facing the opposite way for your cooperative uh, kind of play. But if you're playing solo like I plan to do, then you'll be only using this one side. So let's go into, or at least talk through what is in front of me here. Now, first off, what you're seeing is prototypes. So they're uh, just take things with a grain of salt. Some of these have um, even things like actions have already changed. Uh, there's a couple wording changes here and there. Uh, and again, some of these cards are not in their final form. I believe will be there'll be upgrades to the card quality, component quality. Some of these things are probably rock solid, like the chips, for instance, uh, and likely won't change. Uh, but again, there could be extra characters, there could be all kinds of different stretch goals that are currently even in the Kickstarter as it goes right now. So what we're going to do is the idea of this video is to show you actually how the game plays. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and choose a character. I'm going to explain the rules as we kind of go throughout this. And I'll do a little bit before we start playing and then a little bit during to hopefully tie or at least connect the dots on how this game is played. So we're gonna go ahead and look at our character stack. These characters correlate to the four that are actually mentioned in the Kickstarter. Uh, there is um, only four at the moment. However, I think a couple stretch goals have unlocked and I believe this guy right here, Dr. Elliot, is the very first one that has popped in to play. So the idea behind Ship Theory Games is they are planning on unlocking future characters. The bonus with that is that each character has its own special skill. When they have different skills, it allows them to do different things, which means when you pick your particular individual you want to use, the great thing about that is, well, you are able to actually control what skill you'd like to use going into that particular game. So for me, I want to choose Axe. It's just a personal choice. I could choose anyone. They're all good for different reasons, but I'm going to go ahead and choose Axe. So what we're going to do real quick is I'm gonna actually take these and toss them because we're not gonna need them for the playthrough. And then we're gonna go over here and we're gonna find acts in the player board. So it looks like there's these story background type cards for each character in the game. They have quite a bit of text actually giving you ideas to where the character came from and what their story is. I like stuff like this because it really just adds to the theme. And so there's one for each of the base characters and I'm sure as more of them are unlocked, they will be creating these uh, for them as well. But this is Dex right here, or not Dex, uh, this is Axe right here, and this is the guy we are using. So at some point here, once we get through the initial uh, setup, I will read through this with you so you get an idea of who this guy actually is. So the first thing we're going to do is take our character card. We're going to put it next to the mat. You'll notice there's a key right here. Basically, you use the key to track, very similar to Too Many Bones, and it's lock picking, and you're tracking your points this way. So you may or may not have to actually go in here and... Um, you may have to go in here essentially and uh, unlock a certain uh, combination and when you successfully resolve that lock it might give you a number of points and this is how you track those number of points and stuff like that but there are some rooms you have to do that will give you or don't you don't need to get any points so then this is just there for tracking purposes and you, I'll explain it more once you actually see it in gameplay. This is a round tracker, it's just a round tracker, nothing too crazy, and it has a counter right here, a bead that you can just move along the track as you go. You've also got yourself a skill bead, which is kind of like your um, jack of all trade bead, which is gonna go either on your character special ability when you use it, or it's gonna potentially go in your skill area to get points, which can give you essentially free points. The idea behind it is on your turn, you're allowed to use a skill. Uh, once per turn so I can go oh, I'll put it here for my first turn then on the second round I can progress it to here and on the third round I can progress it here and then boom I gain two points so that's one way you can use that skill beat the other way is to put it here on the extra action marker so first turn you put it here next round goes by you're on here this gives you an extra plus one action what are actions they come from these wonderful dice right here there's two dice in the game uh, this extra action would give you ability to roll a third one on that turn that you acquire that extra action Then the bead comes off so the bead always comes off once it hits the end of the rails You get the you get the advantage of the skill and then you essentially take the bead off So it's kind of a countdown to your wonderful present and then it's gone uh, This is a reset 
The reset, I think there is something here that I'm forgetting for solo, but I know on co-op play, this is what you'd use in order to screw around with your co-op opponent when he's trying to unlock things. You can mess with his uh, cards in hand and things like that and his plans, and uh, we'll talk about that later, but I don't think this is gonna come into play too, too much in the solo playthrough, so I'll just skip it for now. Uh, but I'm sure that there is something important on this one that I'm probably forgetting, and I'll fill it in, maybe in the comments if I remember it. Uh, of course, you have a wonderful cheat sheet, which Chip Theory Games does a great job of, even with too many bones, so you, so you know when you land on certain things in your dice, because these kind of look like Oreos with a yellow filling, you can actually take a look here and find out, well, what does that actually mean? Uh, right here, mechanisms. So this is talking about the chips in the game. So the chips are these guys right here. Every single one, there's only there's four yellow ones. Color doesn't matter except to just distinguish the fact that this these guys are gonna be in the middle of the lock essentially when you start the game. You'll notice each side has two sides and that's the reason why there's two in a row. So when you look up here, if we were to go find, let's say we were trying to find the code. So where's the code one? Okay, we can't see it here, right? Don't know where it is. Well, what's on the other side? Oh, a key. Okay, so we flip the key over, there's the code. So that's the idea of this. It's a cheat sheet to let you know once you know one side, here's a help on what's on the other side. It actually helps you when you're in the game. You're allowed to have this as a reference. Also on the bottom, so that's, sorry, for these four chips, that covers essentially the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because there's four chips, so eight sides. And then on the very bottom, there's an explosive and a gear lock, and that comes from the other, um, fail safe chips which essentially only have gears and explosions on the back and these sometimes are things you need to memorize while you're playing as well uh, and stuff like that but I don't know if I run into that in the first couple scenarios yet but I believe as it gets more advanced uh, then these start coming into play. What these really do actually in most cases when you're playing is they're, they more matter for the fail safe side like this. They'll sit like this and the way the game works when you're setting up to begin the game, which is very difficult to do when you're playing this one hand, <laughs> is you're supposed to take this stack, shuffle it up, and once it's shuffled, you cannot, you're not supposed to know what's on anything. So better, in my opinion, it's almost better to take this, put it underneath the table, and then take two of these fail-safe chips. You wanna flip them over so that they're on the inside, but you're also not supposed to know what's on the inside of each of the ones you pull. So what I would normally do is I would do something like this. I would just grab two of them off the top and then maybe you just shuffle these yellow ones around your hand a bit until you don't know what they are. And then you kind of take these two chips and you can go under the table with them. And if you have really good balancing skills, which I probably don't right now and I'll likely drop them, uh, you go like this. So the idea at the end of the day is you're supposed to have a stack, you're making a sandwich. So you'll have a fail safe on top that you don't know what is underneath of it. And you also have a fail safe on the bottom. And the reason is, is that, well, that's just the way the game's set up. So the idea being, you're not supposed to know what that yellow chip is in the middle, right? So then you go ahead and you grab your next chip and you grab, you shuffle those around, you grab two more and you make yourself another kind of sandwich essentially. So you're doing this over and over again until you've created essentially your pile of chips. And you're doing this, uh, again, like what I might end up doing is messing these or shuffling these around a little bit as well. Uh, you can do it however you want, but at the end of the day, you just need to get four of these in place and then you're ready to go. So once you've got your four in place, then you're golden. So that's that's literally the setup is getting those things in action, getting your card out, getting your points and round out. You've got your skill dice ready to go. You've got two dice ready to roll. And then the other thing you do before you start anything is you always get one of these cards here from this deck. And I'll pull one of these once we start. But first, before we start, I think I'm gonna do a little bit of reading and give you guys some backstory on what is going on and why are we even doing this in the first place. So let's do a little backstory on Axe to find out what Axe is all about. So Axe is a safe cracker, and we'll go ahead and read this story about Axe to, to just learn a little bit about him. So it says, you can never be too careful working on the rails. Axe uh, would know this. Most folks have five fingers on each hand, and Axe used to be like most folks before his two decades on the Royal Rails uh, before his two decades on the railroads, with a thumb and a pinky remaining on his right hand and the pointer, ring, and middle finger, his favorite, still available on his left hand, Axe had the equivalent of one decent mitt that was good enough for him. Switching tracks, fixing wheels and brakes, shoving, uh, shoveling, sorry, engine coal, and protecting the precious cargo, those were the duties of anyone working Royal Rails. The grunts on other rail lines might have a single focus, but the rail company trusted so few folks 
uh, with her car cargo that you had to be a drag of all trades to stick around more than a few weeks. Knowing everything about the sparsely staffed trains had its advantages, Axe knew the guards' schedules and could occasionally sneak into some of the cars that were supposed to be off limits. This was a feat unto itself and with numerous chains and locks to bypass in order to gain entry. The cars often contained safes and over the years Axe learned what made those safes tick. Okay. And on the back, there's even more here. So it said, it was remarkable. His hearing was shot. The roar of the steam engine wrecked his ears long ago. Axe had learned to crack safe strictly by feel, a few tools of his own creation. Call it a gift or a call it luck, but he could crack any Royal Company safe in minutes. For all the extra sense Axe had for safe cracking, he sure couldn't make much, make much of their contents. Sure, there were occasional sacks of coins or cryptic codes written on notes, but more often he found vials of liquid or pills he could only assume were medicine. Sometimes blue, sometimes red, they were always in small quantities. But on rare occasions, a bottle of pills would be alone inside the vast iron vaults. Of course, Axel would help himself to a sip or a pill or two whenever he pleased. Ha, huh, Axel. So that right there is actually an example of a typo with the Axel, it should be Axe. Uh, and while he didn't notice any benefits from his experimentations, he didn't notice any ill effects either. In fact, he felt at the top of his game. Axe assumed he'd been found out uh, eventually, but nobody suspects the most the mostly deaf guy, especially one who's missing half his fingers. While making his way through the cars one night, Axe noticed a small lockbox on top of one of the safes, a time and location uh, a time and location glistening gold, glisten gold embossed on the bottom. He knew the address well on an unkept extension of the train station. The time was concerning. 2 a.m. was not the time to be near the trains, but that didn't scare Axe. He figured the worst that could happen was losing another finger. Yeah, it sounds about right. So he doesn't really uh, enjoy or like keeping his fingers around, but this is the guy we've chosen to be, so we're going to just throw his character here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to read through the actual solo playthrough, or at least solo story, to kind of bridge the gap as to what we're doing here. It's called The Station. Now, there may or may not be more, of this content coming during the Kickstarter. So we'll see when the Kickstarter uh, begin. Well, I guess it's already begun, but uh, I believe there's already an add-on, I think, for some more solo content. So that's already really exciting uh, to hear that they're working on that. And they're also planning, I think, on giving uh, some of it away during the, in digital means and stuff like that. But we'll read this because we're currently at the station. So this one says, everyone looked around um, uneasily. No one present had any reason to expect that he or she would be the only one here, but something about the other five who showed up filled the air with tension. It also didn't help that this part of the station was well lit. They could hear the Royal Company night watchmen laughing and chatting no more than a block away. Six people gathered awkwardly near the train station at 2 a.m. would draw attention, maybe even gunfire, and soon. Nobody said a word as they sized each other up until a voice behind them broke the silence. So just a little backstory on this. The idea is when you play solo, you actually are allowed to use up to six characters, I believe. And I don't understand exactly how it works to a T, but I believe, so right now we've chosen Axe, but we have access to six characters. And the idea is there's a, there's a bunch of rooms that you have to go through that correlate to the station. So in this case, I have four rooms that I have to go through. And from my understanding is you're able to fail essentially. And every time you fail, it's like one of these um, lock picking or safe cracking individuals is almost kicked out of the group. And it's almost like the next lock picker's turn to try kind of thing. So it's basically you've got four rooms you need to crack through with six characters. So that just goes to show that this game can be difficult. And not only is there just regular um, you know, objectives on the cards for each room, which I'll show you in a bit. There's also challenge mode where it makes things even more difficult, where you have to do things in even shorter rounds or maybe put some type of restriction on you. So it can be pretty tough. So let's go ahead and read the back side of this. Oh, look at this. So welcome, a masked woman said in an uneven measured tone, I see none of you had issues opening your lock boxes. The key inside is unique to you and you alone. Keep it close. Without another word, she brushed past them and up to the door. Even from where they stood, it was obvious the lock protecting this entrance was not normal. In fact, the keyhole itself was hidden from view behind a series of fake wall plates and fail-safe triggers. And yet, with a ball pick and a short hook in her right hand and a rake in her left, the woman sprung the complex lock in seconds. That kind of speed on that kind of lock was next to impossible, so the entire group was dumbfounded, and she knew it. Inside, she instructed. Everyone quickly followed. The masked woman spoke again, even while the group still piled into the small foyer 
of what looked to be the train conductor's office. Listen up, she said uh, curly. You are here because you are curious. This place holds many secrets, ones, uh, ones I know you are interested in. You also know your way around the best locks in the city, half of which are built into this place and others like it. We will need all of us working together to overcome such obstacles, she continued, but first I must know your strengths and weaknesses. Pair up and face off against one another. She handed out intricate boxes covered with gears and levers. There was a pause as the group tried to digest all they had just heard, but the click of a lever on Axe's box and a sheepish, gr sheepish grin on his face snapped them to attention. This challenge was on. Then it says right here for solo challenge, proceed to the station room one card. So that's that. We're going to go ahead. Actually, we'll just leave it on her so she can stare at us uh, and make us feel terrible about ourselves. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and pull the station room one card. And we'll read this. This is the beginning of our scenarios. She didn't give her name, yet she knew each of theirs. Her elaborate metal mask was full of intricate patterns, diamond shapes, and studs, and looked as if it was permanently locked to her face. Uh, it's time, she said, as she opened uh, a panel on the back wall, exposing an intricate grouping of protected me mechanisms that all rotated at unique intervals. Which one of you wants to put your skills to a real test, she asked. If you're the lucky one, take your key and insert it here. The station will only allow access to each key once per night. So pass or fail, once you've attempted a lock, we won't have need of your skills again this evening. This is again talking about the fact that once you fail trying to go through a room, you are gone. She no longer wants to talk to you, see you have anything to do with you, you are gone, and this is where you'd move on to your next lock picker uh, to try to get into this uh, particular lock. So here we go, this is the objective. So the objective for room one is goal, solve this lock before the room wins. Now, just a little bit of backstory, this one does not require, at least from my understanding, Anything to be gathered from this deck that involves points. And I know you guys don't know too much about this deck just yet. You'll see it in a future room play that I'll be doing next. I'll be going from uh, from room one to room two, but I won't be going any further than that because I do not want to spoil anything. And as this is a Kickstarter preview, that's about as far as I'll go. But this one here, we'll talk about this deck in room, uh, in room two. In room one, you don't even need it because you are not gathering any points before you go for the major lock. The major lock is actually right here on the card and all it says is, goal, solve this lock before the room wins. So we just have to get this combo lock done. So what does this combo lock mean? This means we need to get this series of three symbols in a row from left to right, okay? So that means in this area here, we need to get all three in a row from left to right, and we need to be able to reveal them, and uh, when we reveal them, they have to be correct, and they have to be in order, which makes it nice and tough. The room rules to start for a normal setup, which we've done, room goes first. So the room's actually gonna go first, and it's gonna rotate all four mechanism stacks. So when we start this in the next video, it's gonna rotate all the stacks, which will have all the stacks go like this. As of right now, that doesn't really do much because we don't know anything about what's here, so there was no real reason to do that, but you'll see, at the beginning of every single time the room goes, at the beginning of every round, that is gonna to start to mess with us as we try to remember what is in each of these stacks. So I'm just gonna put it back to where it was because we'll continue with that when we play through it. Uh, what else do we got here? So uh, next, remove the failsafe from the hidden mechanism. So what'll happen is, whichever, after we rotate, whatever mechanism lands here, which is this one, or I guess, just hypothetically say it's this one, you lose your failsafe. So this chip right here will come off. When, that ch uh, when it's uh, removed, uh, you flip the stack. So it says, uh, next, remove the failsafe from the hidden mechanism. So this is the hidden area, this one right here. So we remove this mechanism, and then we're going to flip the stack, and, oh sorry, we remove the failsafe from the hidden mechanism. If there is no failsafe, sorry, flip the stack and remove the failsafe. So essentially, and I don't want to show this because I'll, I'll, you'll be able to see what's in the middle and I'll be able to see what's in the middle. I don't want to see it. But essentially, you, if it was like this and it ended, you would be taking this top chip and chucking it. Uh, if it was the yellow chip that was on top and this one was gone, then you'd be flipping the stack, which would put another failsafe chip on top. And if there was just a yellow chip and no other uh, failsafes on the bo bottom or top, so no black chips on the bottom or top, um, then... What does it say? Oh, then you lose. If there's no fail, so it says if no fail safe, oh, that's nasty actually. Um, if no fail safe can't be removed or you fail your attempt in solving this lock, the room wins. Okay, so essentially that's that's pretty nasty. So 
basically we don't want the fail safes to disappear. That's, that's the main goal of room number one. Uh, there's also down at the bottom here a challenge mode, which we won't do, but this is where you, when you, this is the replayability factor, so you can come back in later and say, I want to challenge this room again, and, uh, you know, in another playthrough, and you can, this one says at the start of the room's turn, place room skill bead on your leftmost mechanism stack, so that would be this one here, and this stack cannot be disarmed, peaked, or flipped, or swapped, so that's nasty, so that just means you can't really do much with this stack, you don't know what's here, it really limits you, there might be other things you can do, but it seems to eliminate most of the uh, uh, abilities or actions that you can do, which I'll be getting into in the next video. Uh, but you can see how nasty that can be when you don't know one of the four and you're trying to solve a lock that requires, in most cases, uh, at least three, if not two or one. Uh, in this particular case, we've only got to deal with three. Sorry about the focus there. So that's that. So now we're good. I think we've covered the general setup, although you can tell if you are familiar with the game, this is the first time you're playing it, the setup literally takes like probably under five minutes. You're putting the mat down, you're, put, you're, you're sandwiching these mechanisms between the fail safes, you're putting your character down, you're dropping two cards, you're putting your deck together with a good shuffle, and you're ready to go. All right, so the reason this video is 21 minutes is because we read a lot of the backstory and I also kind of walked you through what some of these things are just briefly. So I'm hoping I've kind of gathered your interest, at least you are kind of intrigued, and hopefully we'll be able to jump into the next video here. The idea is in the next video we will finish off room number one in one video, and then we're gonna go ahead and do room number two in one video. So at the max here I'll do three videos, that's when it's gonna stop, and from that point on hopefully this gives you enough to make a decision for yourself as to whether or not this is something you want to add to your collection. So again, hope this was helpful, and uh, until next time guys, keep on rolling solo.